Uh, today, I'm with Ernie Grolleman. He has a degree in engineering. And he has a few thoughts, and he's done a lot of research on the burning of wood uh, for home heating. And Ernie finds there are problems with that. Uh, Ernie, uh, just what are your findings uh, with um, the burning of wood? <clears throat> I found a lot of problems. Um, I've got some pictures like the one on the wall right here that show houses being inundated by wood smoke. Whole cities being inundated by wood smoke. Countries being inundated by wood smoke. And lots of um, problems, threats to life, health, safety, and welfare. And it's, it's kind of like um, a new environmental disaster uh, with death, disease, global warming, and solutions uh, that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, on the next page, <clears throat> you can see more pictures of the wood smoke inundating cities. Uh, the picture at the top of the page is Launceston, and the problem got to be so intense there that the AMA in Australia had to recommend a total ban on wood heaters there. And ABC News reported that in 2006. And just to show you that it's not just on the other side of the earth, I have a picture <coughs> right here of Denver that's engulfed in wood smoke. And <coughs> there's another picture that I have of Edmonton, Canada engulfed in wood smoke. And it's kind of like a, a, a picture book that I have here, really. I got another picture from the Massachusetts Clean Air Organization that shows uh, a neighborhood community uh, with wood smoke. And if you look on the right-hand side of the photo, everything appears to be fairly clear. You can see the houses and the trees, but on the left side of the photograph, you can see the smoke. It's like a fog in this valley. Uh, like a cloud that's descending upon this town. And it's really covering the trees in the background. You can hardly even see them. It's such a problem. <coughs> and I have another picture of a, a condominium projects that, that's engulfed in the wood smoke. You can see the smoke just drifting through the valley. Uh, it's kind of protected in a valley, so the winds go over the valley and the trees. And when there are calm winds, that smoke just stays there, and builds up and builds up. And to show you that the problem isn't uh, <clears throat> uh, just from places far away, I've also got a couple of pictures here uh, from the local area. I have a picture of an outdoor wood boiler in Oakland, Maine. And as you can see in this picture right here, the, the smoke is going up and then curving down, and it's coming down on top of an old mill complex. It's completely engulfing that mill complex. The smoke moves around and it goes in different directions. When it was going towards the woods in the background, it completely filled up the woods. And the person who took this photograph zoomed in, and you can see it a little bit clearer uh, <clears throat> in the bottom photograph. The problems that you were asking about were really, really coming to the fore in this area. Uh, she asked me, the person who took this photograph asked me to help her because I have an engineering degree and I had the same problem in, in my neighborhood. So I went over there and I took one look at it and I said, oh my God, this is a terrible, terrible problem. You know, somebody could have a heart attack and an asthma attack and die from this. And I was so concerned about it that I went and I talked to the building inspector and I warned him that somebody could have a heart attack and die from this. And somebody could have an asthma attack, like my daughter had an asthma attack. And then <clears throat> um, a few months later, there was a man who was working in the mill who died 
of a heart attack. I got the idea that it could happen from some material that was given to me by the American Lung Association. There was a Dr. Brown who wrote a report on outdoor wood boilers, and he said, excessive smoke at 30 micrograms per cubic meter for three hours can cause heart attacks and asthma attacks. I was seeing it in my backyard, and when I saw this smoke that was even worse than what I was getting, I had to think it could happen here. So I warned the city that it could happen, and then it did, in my opinion, anyhow. And, and a doctor that I talked to said, is she thought that it had to have something to do with that heart attack too. It's not the sole cause. Guy obviously had heart disease, you know, beforehand. But she said she thinks it, it had to be involved because the smoke is is so intense. A brown cloud is what the UN is calling it. That's covering China and that whole southern Asia area, and the the amount of smoke it, it is very bad too when when they measure it. Ernie, speaking of the brown cloud in China, I think I had just seen something recently about <clears throat> China and what they fuel uh, their economy with. And it is my understanding that they are uh, huge users of coal and uh, not wood. They, the comparatively little wood is being burned in their industry compared to coal. So would you probably say that that brown cloud and the burning of coal does create a brown colored cloud. Uh, as a merchant seaman, I learned that you can tell the condition of your boiler by the color of the smoke. Uh, <clears throat> anything other than a white smoke or no smoke at all is not good. That, that's a very good point. Um, the air pollution experts are monitoring this very, very closely. And you are correct that China relies almost exclusively upon coal for their electric power generation and for a lot of, of, of their, their heating needs for big buildings and whatnot. But the scientists who are studying this say there's probably more smoke that's coming from wood burning because they use the wood burning in their homes to cook with and to heat their homes. They actually burn whatever they can get their hands on. And they're reporting that a lot of the times they gather the dung from the cows, they let it dry, and they burn that. So it, it's not solely wood smoke, and it's not solely coal or dung. It's a mixture of all of it. Uh, but a large component of it is the, the wood smoke. And there are a lot of things that we can do to solve that problem. You can supply the poor with weatherization, insulation of windows, walls, the first floor, the roof, use lie heap as needed, supply the poor with electric fireplaces and quartz heaters to use zone heating to cut the energy use in half. Among other things, Ernie also suggested uh, the use of pellet stoves. A few days after listening to Ernie, I decided to check out an alternative to pellet burning. To burn wood pellets, you need to buy a rather expensive special stove to burn them in. Plus, you need electricity to run the stove. I'd heard about a hardwood briquette made in central Maine that can be burned in an ordinary wood stove, costs the same as a cord of wood, requires no electricity, and burns as clean as wood pellets. I went to North Vassarboro to learn about a window manufacturer that makes hardwood briquettes with their hardwood scraps. I talked with Tim Downing, owner of Durathorn Window, which makes high-end efficiency windows and turns their waste wood into a heating product. He had this to say. This is our DuraBrick product and uh, we began making this uh, to heat our facility and to offer to the public consumer uh, who is burning wood uh, and has a traditional wood stove, fireplace, or wood boiler. Uh, and the reason we got into it was because 
We do have uh, excess uh, sawdust and end cuts. Uh, all of our product that we manufacture and the wood that we bring in uh, is hardwood in nature and is all kiln dried so it, it was the perfect byproduct material uh, in order to work with the, the Durabrick and, and manufacture it. This is a quickie tour of how waste scrap is made into briquettes. The scraps are collected into barrels and then emptied into a grinder that breaks them into mulched size pieces. They are then piped over a large hopper where they are mixed with sawdust that was augered from the mill and into another hopper. Upon demand this mixture is stirred in yet another hopper where it is transferred to the compressing machine where heat and pressure are applied to cause the natural lignin in the wood fibers to bond into fist size briquettes. No chemicals whatsoever are used. The briquettes are then piped to the final hopper where they periodically drop for storage. Under that hopper, the briquettes are then loaded into either 8 pound or 35 pound paper bags. The worker then carefully weighs out the proper amount and quickly seals the bag with a stitching machine. The biodegradable and eco-friendly bags are then loaded into a trailer where they are now ready for shipping. By the way, the heat required to compress the scrap sawdust mixture is created by a forced air waste boiler that uses some of the scraps created by the manufacturing company. Today, even within five minutes of loading the boiler, you can see that it is burning quite clean by the light white colored smoke. And the boiler is already putting out over 845 degrees. I decided to try some of the briquettes out on my own home. Uh, on the first day I tried it out. It was a fairly cloudy day uh, with the briquettes and as you can see five minutes after starting the fire uh, there's hardly any smoke at all visible in this shot. And of course on the next day it was a little clearer on that day but again with the same amount of wood with the same amount of kindling everything being equal uh, as you can see there was a lot of smoke coming uh, from the regular cordwood which I had been drying since early summer and I I kept it dry with the tarp as well before I leave, I'd like to remind you that no matter what you burn, there is going to be some form of residue or pollution, if you will, whether it be visible or invisible. So please be responsible, and whatever you are using for heat, use it carefully, and do try to maximize the efficiency. It will not only save you money, but it will also help save our environment.